I'm Bob Cook, Chevrolet Sales Promotion. You're about to see our 1962 Chevrolet cars and trucks in action against competition. You and I know that Chevrolet products are good, but it is only in an out-and-out -out performance comparison that we find out just how good they really are. Some of the things that you'll soon see are highly spectacular, but let me assure you that they are authentic in every respect and are dramatic proof of the excellence built in to your 62 Chevrolet products. Now, see for yourself and take what you find here and put it to work. Through the ages, when it has come to pitting one man's honor and ability against another's, a duel has been called for to settle the issue once and for all. So now Chevrolet, with due respect to its 1962 competition, challenges them to a duel. A duel to be waged in fairness to both sides. Yes, a duel to prove once and for all who has the best cars and trucks in 1962. Here's your first eye-opener, that new Chevy 2.6 matched against Rambler Classic, Valiant, Falcon, and Comet in a quarter-mile acceleration test. Standard six engines, standard transmission. They're off. And look at that Chevy 2 roaring out ahead of the pack. Actually, this Chevy 2 is the hottest performing car in its field, leaving everything else in the lurch. Now let's test the Chevy 2 against that new Ford Fairlane. And just to add some interest, we're going to handicap the Chevy by having it turn sideways. There goes the Chevy 2. way out front. No wonder that Fairlane has a Falcon engine, which is no great shakes even in a Falcon. That was such a walk away, let's try it again. But this time, let's see what the Chevy 2 four-cylinder model can do against the Fairlane. And there it goes, a four against a six. And it's a front place runner all the way. Now let's raise the stakes. A Chevy 2-6 against the full-sized Ford Galaxy V8, 120 horsepower against 170. And look at that. Outmatched by 50 horsepower, yet the Chevy 2 is already way out ahead. And it's Chevy 2 again. Moving up the model line, here's the Bel Air 6 pitted against the Fairlane. That Bel Air weighs nearly 700 pounds more than the Fairlane, but it leaves that Fairlane looking like it's tied to a post. It's another smashing win for Chevrolet. And here come the powerhouses. Three top-of-the-line cars, Chevrolet Impala, Plymouth Fury, and Ford Galaxy 500, all with comparable V8 engines. Both the Ford and the Plymouth Fury are supposed to be hot cars, but look what's happening. Impala's 327 cubic inches of blazing power leave no doubt about the outcome of this race. Now let's concentrate on our prime competitor. This time, as a handicap, the Impala makes a 180-degree turn. The Galaxy 500 is so far ahead. Can the Impala ever close the gap? It seems impossible, and yet, look at that baby go. What a performance. What a car. Man, you've got to have wings to beat that 327. Or can you beat it even with wings? Let's find out. A 250 horsepower Impala against a 530 horsepower twin-engine Cessna airplane. 
How's this for a race? Here they go. With all the tremendous surging power of that 327 engine, the Impala is out to an instant lead. There goes the plane, airborne now at the half mile, but the Impala is still ahead. 120 miles an hour. Performance sells automobiles. Economical performance sells even more. Each of these six cars, Falcon, Fairlane, Comet, Rambler Classic, and Valiant, each with standard engines and the four-cylinder Chevy 2, will get exactly one gallon of regular gas. If the car runs out of gas, the driver will have to walk. The men match coins, the winner getting his choice of cars. The course selected lies just north of Phoenix, Arizona, running south on Black Canyon Highway, east on Bell Road, then north on Scottsdale Road, a distance of 33 and 6 tenths miles from the starting point to the finish line at the Last Chance gas station. We'll leave them now and come back later nearer the finish to see who rides and who walks to the Last Chance gas station. Meanwhile, Here's our next test, ride and comfort. And this is one way the difference among cars can be clearly seen. An ordinary water glass is cemented to the hood of each car. A ping pong ball is dropped into the glass. Now watch the ball as we drive the Impala on a very rough vibration course. In spite of the terrific hammering the wheels are getting, Every bit of road shock is being effectively soaked up by those famous Chevrolet coil springs. Now the Ford Galaxy 500. Look at the difference when we run the Galaxy over the same course. How about that now? Isn't that something? Now the Plymouth Fury. From the way that hood is shaking, you'd think it wasn't securely latched. But believe it or not, it is. And here you have all three at once for direct comparison. Ford Galaxy 500, Chevrolet Impala, and Plymouth Fury. Now let's try it with the Fairlane. Look at the ball this time. Compare this with the Bel Air. Again, there's just no comparison. Here's another test, handling. Just look at the way the Chevy 2 whips around the pylons without once getting outside the white line. Handling ease, a Chevrolet specialty. The flare on top is to help you compare the amount of roll between one car and another. Let's just hold our Chevy 2 at this difficult seventh pylon and then compare the performance of other cars at the same place and at the same speed. Here's the Falcon. The front end washes out and it simply cannot be kept within the white line. Here it is at that tricky pylon, way outside the lines. The Rambler is sluggish on these twisting turns. It's hard to steer, slow to respond. Of all competitive cars in this test, the Comet comes closest to the Chevy 2. The Fairlane is sloppy on the turns, hard to control, tiring the driver. But now watch the Bel Air. With all its solid big car weight, it whips around these pylons with amazing ease. And the pylons are still spaced for shorter wheelbase cars. The penalty some manufacturers pay for springs that are too soft is in having a station wagon that bottoms on the bumps. So let's take these four wagons, loaded exactly the same. Josephine here will be present at each test to give us her impressions of the ride as each car hits the same bump at the same speed, 40 miles an hour. The microphone in back will enable us to hear if the wagon hits bottom. Here's the Ford. 
Now the Dodge. Now the Rambler. And now the Chevrolet. Let's try it again, but from the inside this time, the Ford. And look at Josephine in complete collapse from the shock, the Dodge. The Rambler. And the Chevrolet at exactly the same speed. There is a difference, isn't there? Imagine how much worse those other cars would have been with a full load. And speaking of load carrying, here's a real test of the monoplate rear springs in the Chevy 2 on the left. 1,128 pounds of cement on the tailgate, and the tail is still well off the ground. While the Falcon on the right, with the same weight, is almost dragging its tailpipe. Rambler isn't much better. Its low-slung gas tank is almost on the ground. Here we've added 282 pounds. 1,410 pounds in all, but with those sturdy monoplate springs, it's still up and over for the Chevy 2. With the same load, Falcon quickly runs aground. Nine sacks have to be lifted off the tailgate before it clears the ground. Rambler's also in trouble. Six sacks have to go before it gets that low-hanging gas tank out of the dust. Here, in another test of its monoplate springs, Chevy 2, with 1,128 pounds of cement in its trunk, easily clears the road. While the Fairlane, with multi-leaf springs and the same load, is dragging its tail in the dust. But now let's go back and check up on our economy run. Fairlane and Rambler are already out of the race, and here goes the Comet. Here's another foot sore contestant, and still another about to be, the driver of the Valiant, whose car has also given up the ghost. And here's our old friend the Falcon, looking for a place to park for a while. Of all the cars, only the Chevy 2 is still on the road. We haven't quite made it to our hoped-for goal, but that amazing Chevy 2 has proved itself an all-out economy winner by going farther on that one gallon of gas than any other car in the test. And remember, this is the same car that beat the Fairlane in the acceleration race. At the end of the run, at a constant speed of 40 miles per hour, here is the exact position of the various contestants. Fairlane ran out first, followed by Rambler, Comet, Valiant, Falcon, and Chevy 2. On that single gallon of gasoline, our Chevy 2-4 in this test covered exactly 33 and 6 tenths miles. Think of it, 33 and 6 tenths miles. In a similar test with two standard sixes, a Ford Galaxy and a Chevrolet Bel Air, the Ford dropped out almost a mile behind the Chevrolet. And economy does sell cars. Towering out of the desert east of Phoenix are the wild and rugged Superstition Mountains. Breathtaking in their scenic beauty, but perilous too, demanding the very best of cars and drivers alike. 
for the brink of the road often drops straight down a thousand feet or more. And the slightest mistake, the least miscalculation, may prove costly in the last degree. Just watch this. a dangerous, dangerous country. And it's here in this grim terrain that our next test will be conducted. As an acid test of brake safety, the Ford Galaxy, Plymouth Fury, and Chevrolet Impala are going to run to the bottom of this long switchback mountain road. The drivers will go as fast as they possibly can, applying their brakes hard and often on the sharp curves in a deliberate effort to heat them up. As you know, any brakes will stop you once. Any brakes will stop you twice. But in hard, repeated usage like this, brakes tend to heat and to fade, usually when you need them most. But it's in situations like this that Chevrolet's better brake design and better brake linings pay off in a greater brake safety. So watch what happens. Because somewhere down the line, as the final test, we've set up a rock slide where all three cars will have to stop and stop fast if they can. Ford's brakes are already getting hot. So are the Plymouth. And here's the rock slide. Stop! The Chevrolet brakes, still cool enough to be effective, have brought the car to a safe, secure stop. But look what's happened to the brakes on the Ford. No wonder they lost their holding power. And Plymouth? Its brakes are so hot they've actually caught fire. This was a control test. The moral is clear. Brakes are something you must count on. With Chevrolet, you can. Some of the strongest selling advantages you have are in the details of features and styling. For instance, take this Rambler Classic. If one is on the robust side, you almost need a shoehorn to get behind the wheel. And when you try to adjust the seat, well, one of the many little surprises Rambler has in store for you. And you have to pay extra for this inconvenience. And here's a little surprise that Ford has for you. They're the seat and back cushions for that nine-passenger Ford station wagon rear seat. But just compare it with the Chevrolet back cushion. At least Ford calls this a cushion. And compare the deep luxury of the Chevrolet seat cushion with this one of Ford. Anyway, it's a gift from Ford to all Ford station wagon customers. But you're going to like it a lot better than they will because you won't have to sit on it. Your wife won't have to sit in this Ford Galaxy seat either. She's lucky she won't, because just look what happens to this girl's sweater when she slides across that seat. Those fibers were pulled out of her sweater by the harsh metallic threads in Ford's so-called luxury fabric. Will the same thing happen in a Chevrolet? No, and what a good sales story this makes, especially for women. Here's that car that Ford claims is new in everything except the name. We won't argue that point, but just so you don't get confused by all their newness, that one in front is a 1957 Fairlane. The next one is a 1962 Fairlane. 
and the one in back is a 1962 Comet. The 1962 Fairlane, sired by Ford, foaled by Comet, with nothing really new, including the name. Yes, suddenly it's 1957 all over again. And again. And again. As with Bel Air on the left and Chevy 2 on the right, Chevrolet styling is a lot more than just advertising slogans. With Chevrolet, styling is a buying reality. Say, what's going on here? Ah, yes, our gift to Ford. A solution at last to the perennial problem of the non-counterbalanced Falcon hood. With this handy little invention, you won't have to worry about that hood falling and smashing your fingers anymore. Here's another little drama. This one involving comparative trunk space. The base fits easily in that big, generous Chevy trunk. This fellow's smart. He knows that Ford trunk is too shallow to take that base. So he's going to lay it down on its side so he can be absolutely sure it won't break when he slams down the lid. Sorry, partner. The 16-inch clearance under that Ford trunk lid is just a little too tight a fit. The only real solution, as more and more Ford owners are finding out these days, is just to tire down and take your chances. Again on the subject of luggage capacity, just take a look inside this Greenbrier. Compare the big, generous luggage capacity back of the rear seat with the far less space available in the Econoline station bus. Here's a test for the Greenbrier, pulling in and out of a carport. What's so difficult about that? Well, let's let the Econoline try it. Watch what happens when it discharges its load of passengers and the springs begin to rise. Don't laugh. It could happen to you in a Ford Econo line. In this test, we're going to compare two truck engines. Chevrolet's long outstanding 261 engine against Ford's new 262. Ford claims they get greater torque and horsepower from their engine, so let's find out if that's true. There they go, Ford on the left, Chevrolet on the right. Same load, same tires, Almost identical axle ratios, the only difference is in the engines. And the facts speak for themselves. When they talk about cotton-picking wagons out here, they mean it. These big cotton vans weigh eight and a quarter tons each, a total of 33 tons. And guess what's pulling them? Yes, a Corvair 95. 33 tons dead weight. How do you like that? Let's let the Ford Econoline try it now. No, we're going to have to pare down the load a little. Three wagons this time. Still no dice. Now we're down to two wagons. And that seems to be just about a match for the Econoline. 
16 and a half tons. Just exactly half of the 33 tons pulled by the Corvair 95. In test after test, the Corvan consistently outperforms and outclasses the Econovan, proving again its well-known ability to get its cargo through to its destination despite the hazards of bad roads and rough going. On the same grade, the Econovan falls back, wheel spinning. Here again, the Corvan proves it has that performance extra that means so much when schedules are tight and delays costly. a test with particular application in hot weather. After running for half an hour with a load, windows closed and outside temperature 72 degrees, the temperature in the cab of the Corvair 95 is 91 degrees. While in the Econoline, under the same conditions exactly, the temperature at the side of the engine cover right there by the driver is 286 degrees making the cab temperature 104. Oh yes, after similar heating conditions, if a careless attendant happens to remove the radiator cap on the Econoline, this is the likely result. Ride is doubly important in a truck to the driver and cargo and to the truck itself. Each of these vehicles, a Chevrolet fleet side and a Ford style side, has a charge of explosive, the equivalent of a full stick of dynamite buried under its cargo. The charges will be set off electrically through these knife switches, one on each truck. As long as the switch handle stays up, we're all right. But if road shock causes it to fall and close the circuit, watch out. A bump deliberately put in the road and that Chevrolet is coming fast. Chevrolet crosses it safely. Here comes the Ford, hold your breath. Just in case you're wondering if there really is a charge of explosive in that Chevrolet, here's your answer. Though the explosive charge was the same in each vehicle, the Ford tailgate has been blown out by the blast and the floor buckled. While the strong wood floor and double-walled construction of the Chevrolet tailgate and sidewalls show almost no damage at all. Yes, wherever trucks are working, you'll find Chevrolet trucks out front in performance, ride, safety, in all the essential elements that go to make a truck worth its salt on the job, wherever that job may be. Back in the old days of the West, this was a familiar sight. The lone cowboy fleeing from the bad man, his life depending on the speed and stamina of his trusty pony. If you were to reenact a stirring scene today, you'd discover that the trustiest steed you could find would be a 1962 Corvair. So let's just sit back and watch what would have happened in the old days of the West if you had had a Corvair to ride instead of a horse. It's high noon and troubles are ruined. Our hero and his new Corvair doesn't know it yet. But a no-good band of outlaws has the whole town staked out, just waiting for him to arrive. Trouble in the shape of Buck Fairlane and his cut-price gang. Comical Comet. Vicious Val from Dirty Dodge City. Rambling Rambler. Flaky Falcon. 
every street is blocked. There's only one way out. The livery stable, quick! can match Corvair in action like this. Here's where they separate the men from the boys. out performance. The rest just aren't in it with Corvair. And that's our version of what would have happened if a cowboy in the Old West had had a 1962 Corvair. Speed, traction, maneuverability all wrapped up in one of the sportiest packages on four wheels. In fact, for any kind of driving, in any place you want to go, whether it's on a city boulevard or out here on the spectacular Apache Trail in Arizona, you just can't find a better car than Chevrolet. Take that new Chevy too. It's not only the hottest performing car in its class, it's also a real road car, able to do whatever cars of this size are expected to do. And a lot of things no car is expected to do. But the Chevy 2 does it. Right up on two wheels. Let's try that again. But let us ride in the car this time. And as an acid test of ruggedness, tell Joey Chitwood to turn this Chevy 2 clear over on its top. Joey's all right. And so's the Chevy 2. If you don't think so, watch. There it goes, a little scuffed, but basically undamaged. Just try to top this if you can. And this too if you can. Top the performance of a Chevy truck if you can. Undeniable proof of rugged, all-out quality construction. Yes, and top this for road holding ability. Corvette at 140 miles an hour on the high speed track and no hands on the wheel. In every quality that counts in the making of a car, Chevrolet in 1962, any Chevrolet, every Chevrolet has an over competition in any kind of duel you can name. So start notching your gun right now, because 1962 is a Chevrolet year, and 1962 is your year. Anything that runs, jumps, swims, flies, or rolls on four wheels is put to the test of performance. century, Florida has been one of the world's greatest proving grounds for automobiles. And the most celebrated test course of all is the famous measured mile at Daytona Beach, 
where cars of every make, model, type, and design have been put to the ultimate test of performance. Here in 1927, Major Seagrave's mighty Sunbeam first topped the 200 mile an hour mark. In its day, it was the fastest land-going vehicle on Earth. Now this famous beach will become the scene of a new kind of test. Today, more than 35 cars and trucks, Chevrolet and competitive makes, have been assembled at the celebrated testing ground for your 1963 Chevrolet product performance report. Decision at Daytona. I'm George Smith, your host. The first thing I want to stress is that the tests you are about to see are strictly on the level. Since a good many of you will undoubtedly go out and try some of these tests yourselves, it would be pointless for us to make any claims for Chevrolet that wouldn't stand up to the facts. So we kid you not. We will make no false claims for Chevrolet. We will make no exaggerated claims for Chevrolet. Everything you see will be exactly as it happened. All cars will have comparable engines, transmissions, rear axles, and tires. All engines will have been tuned up to factory specifications. Every effort will have been made to be completely fair to all vehicles involved. As a further assurance of authenticity, the Spence Chevrolet Company of Daytona Beach, Florida, will be on hand to observe the operation. I'd like you to meet these people. Lee Spence, President, Spence Chevrolet, Daytona Beach. I'm Merle Baumgartner, Sales Manager, Spence Chevrolet. Dick Boo, Service Manager, Spence Chevrolet. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Now let's watch our first test. It's Chevy 2 versus the competition in a rugged test of performance. A hurdles race for Chevy 2, Valiant, Rambler, Falcon, and Fairlane. power per pound of car weight, the Chevy 2 in the far lane pushes out ahead. Let's run that again. This time as the fair lane driver sees it. His hopeless position in the rear gives him an excellent view. Again, more power per pound gives Chevy 2 an extra spurt of acceleration needed not only here, but in all modern traffic conditions. This is a handling test to see how fast each car can make this U-turn without getting out of control. 30 miles an hour to begin with. Now at 45 miles an hour. Chevy 2 above, Falcon below. Chevy 2 above, Valiant below. Chevy 2 above, Comet below. Chevy 2 above, Rambler below. Chevy 2 above, Fairlane below. Performance is as important in a wagon as it is in a passenger car. Here, over 1,700 pounds of Florida oranges and grapefruit in the back of each of three wagons, Falcon, Rambler, and Chevy 2, will give us the story on station wagon performance. Now for the test. On signal, 
the drivers will floorboard the gas pedal in each vehicle. And there goes the Chevy 2. The same extra spurt of power that makes Chevy 2 a livelier car to drive also gives it quicker response as a wagon. Now the regular cars. Chevrolet versus the competition in performance. First with the six-cylinder engines. Let's see that new 230 cubic inch six in action against the Ford and Plymouth sixes. is close, but Ford is completely out of the picture. Now the V8s. Galaxy 352, Plymouth 318, Impala 327. It's an easy win for Chevrolet. The Impala was so far ahead of the Galaxy in that last race, let's take a smaller Impala, the 283 V8, and see what it can do against the Galaxy 352. Even with 25 horsepower less than the Galaxy, the Impala is again out front. A good many people assume that luxury cars like the $6,000 Ford Thunderbird are as much out of Chevrolet's performance class as they are out of its price class. Let's find out the truth about that. the Impala, well across the finish line, while the Thunderbird is completely out of the running. And that was only the 250 horsepower engine in the Impala. Next, the 425 horsepower, 409 cubic inch V8. Watch it in action against Ford's 406. Once again, it's Chevrolet. By the way, where do you suppose the camera was during those runs? In a 1963 fuel injection Corvette. 360 horsepower, all wrapped up in the neatest sports car package on the road today. Here's a test of passing acceleration to show what an extra margin of performance can mean and the time it takes to pass another vehicle. The trailer will maintain a steady 30 mile an hour speed. The light set up in the window of the trailer will give the drivers their signal to start. With the Galaxy 352, watch for the starting light on the back of the trailer. Six seconds flat for the Galaxy. Fury 318. Five and a half seconds for the Fury. And Impala 327. Four and six tenths seconds for the Impala. Ford, six seconds. Plymouth, 
five and a half, Impala, four and six tenths. Brakes and handling are involved in this test. The lights on the hoods, coupled to the brake pedals, are to let you know exactly when each car's brakes are applied. The paint rollers, set at exactly four inches above the pavement, will help judge nosedive. Chevrolet stops 12 feet ahead of the Plymouth, 20 feet ahead of the Ford. A vital margin of safety that could mean all the difference in the world in an emergency situation. All three of these cars claim to have anti-dive features. Let's see about that. Chevrolet dives slightly, but quickly recovers. Plymouth shows little dive, but has poor stopping power. Ford is a poor performer on both counts. Severe nosedive. And poor stopping power. Here we blocked off a quiet residential street and laid out a test route that parallels the stop and go course that's so famous in many performance trials. We're going to have three cars go in and out of each driveway just as fast as they can and see which one can make it in the shortest possible time. 21 stop and goes, 31 changes of direction. A real screamer. The same three cars will participate. Impala 327, Fury 318, and Galaxy 352. Impala. Plymouth Fury. Ford Galaxy. seconds for the Ford. Although driver skill does play a part in a test like this, the Chevrolet couldn't have won without better brakes, better handling, and definitely quicker response. Undoubtedly, the best ride you can get anywhere is on a pair of water skis here at Cypress Gardens. But when it comes to automobiles, a motion picture camera in the back of each of three cars will give us an accurate record of ride in each one. Here are all three at once for comparison. Impala on the left, Fury in the center, 
Galaxy on the right. The Galaxy's ride is too bouncy. Plymouth's too harsh and jarring. Only Chevrolet has the perfect balance of softness and stability. Now let's take a look at special features. First, rocker panels. The smoke test shows how, with a Chevrolet, fresh air is drawn down from the cowl vent, right through the Chevrolet's ventilated rocker panel and out the back, helping to keep it dry and rust-free. The test won't work on a Ford because Chevrolet is the only car with ventilated rocker panels. Here's a test to demonstrate the effectiveness of body insulation. The same microphone in each car will record the difference in sound. Listen first to the Ford. Now the Chevrolet. This time the sound is muffled. That's because of Chevrolet's more effective insulation, not only in the roof, but all through the car. Now let's take a look at some other features that spell the difference in comfort, convenience, and lasting value. For instance, just compare the springy foam cushion padding in the Chevrolet rear seat with the plain cotton batting in the Ford seat. Here's a test to show the comparative electrical power of Chevrolet's Delcatron and the Ford generator. Watch the light on the right as the man hooks it up to the Chevrolet Delcatron. Even though the tachometer shows that the engine is idling at 500 RPM, the light burns brightly. Now he'll hook the light up to the Ford generator. Notice the light does not come on until he speeds up the engine. Only with the Ford engine turning over at above 2,000 RPM does the light come on at all brightly. Chevrolet's Delcatron. More electrical power, longer battery life. Let's take a look at trunk capacity and the case of two wedding cakes. Say. Yes? Will you have me put this cake into the trunk of my impala? Sure. You help me with my galaxy? I'm glad to. Thank you. It'll never fit. Won't make it. Never make it. Impossible. Impossible. This side gotta see. <laughs> about says it for Chevrolet trunk space. Remember this? The new Ford Econoline pickup when it first came out in 1959. Three years have passed. Let's see that same test with a 1963 Econoline. Even with the 175 pound counterweight Ford added to the rear end and with the heavier van body, this can still happen. Try the same test with the Corvan. No gymnastics here.
And as you can see in this test, it still has the same amazing ability to get around in almost any kind of road condition. Again, the Econoline's poor basic design not only shows up in deficient handling, but in deficient performance as well. This fellow seems to have caught himself quite a fish. Yes, he has indeed. It's a 1963 Ford Econoline. Hooked fast. Now let's see who lands who. That's a deep sea rig he has, but only an 80 pound test line. The Econoline can't even break that 80 pound test line. Now let's see how his tackle stands up to a Corvair 95 ramp side. Power and traction makes the Corvair 95 a winner in any kind of performance competition. Now for the half tons. Notice how smoothly and easily the Chevrolet backs up this grade. Now watch the Ford. That's called power hop, the result of a badly outdated suspension design. This is a road clearance test. If that wooden post were a boulder, a stump, or a high road center, it would present no problem for a Chevrolet. But for a Ford, with its low slung front axle, it could be disastrous. Next, basic body construction. A series of tests to determine comparative strength of cabs and bodies. First, a side door from a Corvan. We've applied all the power available from that truck. And yet, the Chevrolet door with its sturdy double-walled construction shows no appreciable damage. Ford, that's a different story. The Ford door with its single wall construction, is bent double. Chevy's structural rigidity really pays off. Another demonstration of body construction, sheet metal. Watch what a coconut does to the hoods of these two trucks. The Chevrolet, with its underhood bracing, scarcely a dent. The Ford, which has no bracing at all, a two-inch buckle. Now for pickup floor strength. Barely a scratch in the strong wood and steel skid strip flooring of the Chevrolet. Now the Ford. The metal floor now has a permanent pocket where water will collect and rusting occur. 
And here's one final test of structural strength. The Ford tailgate doesn't even begin to support the weight of this 6,000 pound stake truck. Now, a Chevy tailgate. We don't expect Chevrolet truck owners to use the tailgate of their pickups for a bridge. But this test does point up one more reason why Chevy trucks last longer, work more, and are worth more on the trade. Chevy two-ton trucks have a new, slimmer front end this year. And here's what that can mean in truck handling. It can mean the difference between crumpling a fender or clearing without a scratch, as in the Chevrolet. And now, one of the world's biggest drag lines. It weighs three million pounds and chews out a 34 cubic yard bit of earth at every bucketful. And it will start off our story on 1963, Corvair Performance. As a matter of fact, Corvair's performance has been proved so many times, words are no longer necessary. So let's just let it speak for itself. Sand Mountain, the highest point in Florida. It's a 45 degree slope, 450 feet to the bottom. Now watch as a Corvair is deliberately turned over and rolled down the side as an acid test of ruggedness. top of the mountain right down to the bottom in 15 complete rollovers. Now let's see if the engine will start. You've seen
seen your 1963 products put to the test. For there. Chevy 2. Chevrolet trucks. Corvette. And Chevrolet for 63. With advantages you can see. Advantages you can prove. Advantages you can sell.